Ripley in that novel that we'll study together as AP students as well. In other words, it's all going to happen in a cave. We're going to make sure that it's that it's ready to go. Um, and, and so it's it's just it's just a matter now of watching it unfold. You as a, as an audience now watch this unfold, starting at line 160. The day of doom begins in the morning. The dawn rises and uh, Dido's. We, we use that term in the Iliad, Aristia, and we used it in Book 14 to talk about Hera. Here, it's Dido's Aristia. She gets so beautified. I mean, she's, she's stunning. Um, she's like Helen, uh, uh, I'm sorry, like Hera. And, and of course, Helen, we, we kind of got this sense of her as well. We've got the young Ilias, um, Ascanius, the boy. He's godlike as well. And then finally, Aeneas shows up. He's better looking than all of them combined. We've got the young Ascanius out hoping for glory at line 195, out looking for a lion he can kill, and then all of a sudden the storm hits. Well, it drives the two lovers to a cave, and at line 208, we get the consummation. Although, because it's, uh, you know, it's Virgil, we're going we're gonna to be very sensitive to the descriptors. Here it comes, right? Um, we're told Dido and Troy's commander, Aeneas, make their way to the same cave for shelter now. Primordial Earth and Juno, queen of marriage, give the signal, and lightning torches flare, the high sky bears witness to the wedding, that is to say, the consummation of the sex that's being done. Nymphs on the mountaintops wail out the wedding hymn. This was the first day of her death. The first day of grief, the cause of it all. So in other words, Virgil giving us the foreshadowing that we look for, here it is. We know this thing ain't going to end well. The first day of death, there it is, right? D from now on, Dido cares no more for appearances, nor for her reputation either. She no longer thinks to keep the affair a secret. No, she calls it a marriage using the word to cloak her sense of guilt. Sure enough, it is going to, it is going to give rise to all kinds of rumors. Starting at line 220, we get this amazing description of rumor. Rumor, of course, is a woman. This can't shock those of us who understand these as patriarchal texts. Um, but rumor, of course, giving rise to all kinds of uh, raucous mouths, the gossip of 2.30. And we're told by day, rumor keeps her watch, crouched on a peaked roof, uh, clinging as fast to her twisted lies as she clings to the word of truth. Now rumor is in her glory, filling Africa's ears with tale on tale of intrigue, brooding her song of facts and falsehoods mingled. And then she gives an example. Here, this Aeneas, born of Trojan blood, has arrived in Carthage, and lovely Dido dines to join the man in wedlock. Even now they warm the winter. Long as it lasts, with obscene desire, oblivious to their kingdoms, abject thralls of lust, in quo. Such talk, the sordid goddess spreads on the lips of men. And, of course, we'll hear next about Erebus. Now, Erebus, we're told, is the son at line 249, 248, 249, is the son of an African nymph whom Jove had raped. That's actually the language of the poem. Raise the god a hundred splendid temples across the king's realm, uh, wide realm. Let's point, pause for a moment. Let's just say this out loud. The gods, especially Jove, Zeus, the gods can mess around and even rape, and there's no punishments for them. Humans, on the other hand, can fall in love and get involved in this passionate thing called love or violent sex, and it's always going to end up terrible for them, right? Remember that young Ajax will be destroyed because of his raping of Cassandra. Remember, that's how the gods will punish an act that Jupiter will do all the time. Ultimately, though, this leads us to this Iberius. He will complain to Jove at line, two, uh, at line 259. He says, Almighty Jove, by the way, watch the tone. As Iberius, a king, will speak to king god Jupiter with a certain kind of voice, tone. Watch this. Almighty Jove, now as the Moors adore you, feasting away on their gaudy, on their gaudy couches, tipping wine in your, in your honor, do you see this? Or are we all fools, father, to dread the bolts you hurl? All aimless, then, your fire, fires higher in the clouds that terrify us so. All empty noise, your peals of grumbling thunder. That woman, that Vagrant, here in my own land, she founded her paltry city for a pittance. We tossed her some beach to plow on my terms. And then she spurns our offer of marriage. She embraces Aeneas as lord and master in her realm. And now, this second Paris. It's fascinating. Virgil joining together brilliantly all the different storylines. Notice, Averius will say, this Aeneas is like a second Paris coming in, ruining everything. Look what he says about Aeneas. Leading his troop of eunuchs. His hair oozing oil, his Nigerian bonnet tucked up under his chin. He revels in all that he's filched, stole. 
while we keep bearing gifts to your temples. Yes, yours, coddling your reputation. All your hollow show. Whoa. In other words, you're no real God. If you're a real God, you take care of this problem. What's going on here? It's interesting. Job immediately sees all. It's as, either, it's as if he's been, you know, kind of looking the other way, or Juno has helped him look the other way. We think of Iliad 14 immediately, don't we, right? And he immediately sends Mercury, Hermes, the messenger God. It's time to get down there and take care of business. Clearly, Aeneas has forgotten and he says it in line 290. If such a glorious destiny cannot fire his spirit, if he'll not shoulder the task for his own fame, does the father of Ascanius grudge his son the walls of Troy? What is he plotting now? What hope can he can can make him loiter among his foes? Lose sight of, of Italian offspring still to come in all the Lavinian fields. Let him set sail. By the way, of course, the Carthaginians are not foes yet. Here we have Virgil reading back into history because, of course, we're familiar with the three Punic Wars where Rome and Carthage were fighting seriously. Mercury will put on his sandals and bring his wand with him. He does this famous flight starting at 310. He sees Aeneas dressed as a foreigner. We think about Mark Anthony dressing as a foreigner. As a foreigner, and Mercury will lash out him at, at once at line 330. Yo! So now you lay foundation stones when he sees them. He's helping build the, the walls of Carthage. You lay foundation stones for the soaring walls of Carthage? Building your gorgeous city, doting on your wife. Notice Mercury will call Dido his wife. Blind to your own realm, oblivious to your fate. The king of the gods whose power sways earth and sky. He's the one who sends me down from brilliant Olympus, bearing commands for you through the racing winds. What are you plotting now? Wasting time in Libya? What hope misleads you so? If such a glorious destiny cannot fire your spirit, if you will not shoulder the task of your own fame, this is an inserted line, but it's a controverted line, but it, it's powerful because, of course, you'll remember he carried his father on his shoulder, right? At least remember Ascanius, rising into his prime. Remember your son. The hopes you lodge in Elias, your only heir. You owe him Italy's realm, the land of Rome. This order still on his lips, the god vanished from sight in empty air. We're told Aeneas is stunned by this, overwhelmed by this, and his hackles bristle with fear. His voice chokes in his throat, we're told, and at line 3, uh, 40, 48 or so, he yearns to be gone. We immediately think of Odysseus at the island of Circe. Remember, for a year, it's Odysseus's men that have to come to him and convince him it's time to go. Here, immediately, Aeneas is like, I gotta get out of here, but to desert the land he loves, thunderstruck by the warnings of, Ju of Jupiter's command. But, line 350, what can he do? Remember, we said the modern condition is to be stuck between Scylla and Charybdis, between two choices, and it's a very difficult one. What can he do? What can he dare say now to the queen in all her fury and win her over? Now, if you have your own copy, don't do this in our school copies, right? But if you have your own copy of this poem, I very much recommend that you get out a red ink pen and circle every question mark from here on. Because a whole bunch of the lines of poetry that are coming will be questions. Question that Aeneas has. Questions Dido has. Questions Anna has. You'll see this. It's brilliant. It's brilliantly constructed. It's all kind of rhetorical questions because obviously we know how this thing's going to end, right? That is to say, the questions have ultimate meaning because we understand how all this is going to come down. The real question isn't, what's he going to do? The real question, as he says, is, is how can he dare say now to the queen in all her fury and win her over? Where to begin? What opening? In other words, I, I, he's, Aeneas is not as good at words as Odysseus is. Odysseus would be a guy that would maybe go to Dido and say, hey, listen, I need to take, um, uh, I need to go on a little sailing adventure here. I need to do this thing, and then I'm going to be right back, and then just sail away and never come back. That's not Aeneas. Aeneas is trying to figure out, what can I say to make all this right? We're told thoughts racing here, there, probing his options, turning to his plan, that plan. Torn in two. Until at his wit's end, this answer seems the best. Two-part dance. One, he's going to call together his men and say, get the ships ready. Two, well, at line 360 he says it. Since Dido, who means the world to him, knows nothing, never dreaming such a powerful love could be uprooted, he will try to approach her. Find the moment to break the news gently. A way to soften the blow that he must leave. All shipmates snap to commands, glad to their orders. True, but the queen, line 368, who can delude a lover? Soon caught wind of a plot afoot, the first to sense the Trojans are on the move. She fears everything now, even with all secure, line 370. Rumor, 
vicious as ever brings her word already distraught that Trojans are rigging out their galleys, gearing to set sail. She rages in helpless frenzy, blazing through the entire city, raving like some menad driven wild when the women shake the sacred emblems. Now, this is going to already take us in the gesture of uh, Euripides Bacchae. You can also write down in 3a that when we get to Shelley's Ode to the West Wind, this menad, fierce menad, to talk about a storm and the wind of the, the west wind is brilliantly done here as well. Driven wild when the wind when the women shake uh, for the Celtic orgy, shouting uh, Bacchae, uh, Bacchus, fire her on. So, last she assails Aeneas before he said a word. Now we're at lines three seventy eight. I'm going to read a good amount now of this because it deserves to be read. Here we go. Dido cannot believe that after all she's done for Aeneas, this is the way this project's going to go down. So, she says, you traitor, you really believed you'd keep this a secret, this great outrage? And if you're starting to circle question marks, now's the time for you to get started. She will begin with a series of questions. Aeneas, by the way, doesn't respond for quite some time. Steal away in silence from our shores? Can nothing hold you back? Not our love? Not the pledge once sealed with our right hands? Not even the thought of Dido doomed to a cruel death? Why labor to rig your fleet when the winter's raw, to risk the deep when the north wind's closing in? In other words, what are you trying to do, sail away in the middle of the winter time? You have to wait till the spring, you know that. You, cruel, she says, heartless. Even if you were not pursuing alien fields and unknown homes, even if ancient Troy were standing still, Who'd sail for Troy across such heaving seas? Even if Troy was alive, you wouldn't sail during this time of the year. What are you thinking? You're running away from me? Oh, I pray you by these tears, by the faith in your right hand. What else have I left myself in all my pain? By our wedding vows, the marriage we began. She calls what, the, what happened in the cave of marriage. If I deserve some decency from you now, if anything mine has ever won your heart, Pity a great house about to fall, I pray you, if prayers have any place, reject this scheme of yours. I mean, it's brilliant. Virgil has told us what it looks like when a city falls. And now he has Dido say to, his, to, her, to her guy, no, 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 this is not, I don't, I, everything's going to ruin. If you do this, this, you destroy everything. In the same way that you, that you were sad about Troy falling, you can't allow this to happen. Thanks to you, she says. Here's what she's given up. The African tribes, the warlords hate me. Even my own Tyrians rise against me. Nobody cares for me. Thanks to you, she says it a second time. My sense of honor is gone. My one and only pathway to the stars, the renown I once held dear. I've given up everything for you. In whose hands, my guess, more questions. In whose hands, my guess, do you leave me here to meet my death? Guest, she comes back to the word. Zania, in other words. That's all that remind, that, that's all that remains of husband now. But why do I linger on until my brother Pygmalion batters down my walls or Iberius drags me off his slave? If only you'd left a baby in my arms, our child, before you deserted me. Some little Aeneas playing around our halls, whose features at least would bring you back to me in spite of all. I would not feel so totally devastated, so destroyed, line 4, 10, 11, 12. The queen stopped. But he, now it's Aeneas, the master of passion. But he, warned by Jupiter now, his gaze held steady, steady, fought to master the torment in his heart. At last, he ventured a few words. And the translation here with uh, Fagels is brilliant. It begins this way, quotation mark. I, dot, 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 you have done me so many kindnesses. It's as if he, he's not sure how he's going to start. This is no Odysseus. He is not fluent with words. Aeneas is far more Achillean in this moment than he is Odyssean, right? He doesn't, he's not very good with words, and his response has always bothered readers. Are you serious? This is the best you could come up with? I, you have done me so many kindnesses, and you could count them all. I shall never deny what you deserve, my queen. Never regret my memories of Dido, not while I can recall myself and draw the breath of life. I'll state my case in a few words. Let, let, hear me out, he says. Hear me out in a few words. I never dreamed I'd keep my, seek, my flight a secret. Don't imagine that. Nor did I once extend a bridegroom's torch. No, he said, first things first, I wasn't going to sail away without talking to you. Second thing, 
nor did I once extend a bridegroom's torch or enter into a marriage pact with you. We're not actually married. We talked about marriage, but we're not actually married. If the fates had left me free, argument three, if the fates had left me free to live my life, to arrange my own affairs of my own free will, Troy is the city, first of all, that I'd safeguard. Troy and all that's left of my people whom I cherish. In other words, he says, the grand palace of Priam would stand once more with my own hands. I would fortify a second Troy to house my Trojans in defeat. In other words, he says it. I would still be with Creusa, my wife, if I had, I mean, if I had any choice in the matter, the gods have willed otherwise, right? Apollo's oracle says, I must seize on Italy's noble land. He says, I told you this already. His, his Latian lots say Italy. There lies my love. In other words, I love you, but I love Rome more. Right? Which will sound very much like what Shakespeare's Brutus will say in JC, huh? Right? There, loves my, there lies my love. There lies my homeland now. If you, a Phoenician, fix your eyes on Carthage, a Libyan stronghold, tell me, why do you grudge the Trojans their new homes on Italian soil? Notice the brilliance of this rhetorical device. He turns the question back on her. What is the crime if we seek far off kingdoms too? In other words, you left Phoenicia, right? And came here on the same grounds. Don't we have the right to leave here and go to Italy? I've already told you that's what the gods told us we have to do. And then he says it. For the first time he mentions it. My father, Anchises, and it's interesting you would mention him. Because we get a sense that if Anchises had been alive, he would not have allowed this foolishness to happen between Aeneas and Dido, right? No way, no way. The father would have been like, no, 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 no. We, we're in Carthage. We can stay here until the spring. But we, we got none of this dalliance foolishness happening. My father, Anchises, whenever the darkness shrouds the earth in its dark shadows, whenever the stars go flaming up in the sky, my father's anxious ghost warns me in dreams and fills my heart with fear. My son, Anchises, I feel the wrong I do to one so dear, robbing him of his kingdom. Lands in the west, his fields decreed by fate. And now, the messenger of the gods, I swear it, by your life and mine, this vast by Jove himself, has brought me firm commands through the racing winds. With mine own eyes, I saw him clear in broad daylight, moving through your gates. With my own ears, I drank his message in. Come, line 450, stop inflaming us both with your appeals. I set sail for Italy, all against my will. Two observations. One, I'm going. Two, I don't want to go. The gods are making it happen. We're told about Dido. And again, this is the dramatic context. I told you this is the great Roman tragedy. It is drama. And, and, and it is high drama. If you were to put this on stage, well, while he was speaking, what was Dido doing? Virgil says, I'll tell you what she was doing. At line 451, 452. Even from the start of his declaration, she has glared at him askance, looking sideways. Askance. Her eyes roving over him, head to foot with a look of stony silence. Till, abruptly she cries out in a blaze of fury. Speech number two. No goddess was your mother. We, we, we think about this very comment made by Priam, remember to Pyrrhus, right before Pyrrhus Jackson. No goddess was your mother. No darn in the sire of your line, you traitor, liar. No. Mount Carcass fathered you on its flinty, rugged flanks, and the tigers of Harisia gave you their dugs to sup. Why hide it? In other words, you're not human. That's what she's saying, right? Why hold back? Notice all the questions. To suffer greater blows? Did he groan when I wept? Notice the adjustment to the from you to he. It's almost as if now she's talking and Aeneas is not even there, right? Did he groan when I wept? Even look at me? Never. Surrender a tear? Pity the one who loves him? What can I say first? So much to say. Now neither mighty Juno nor Saturn's son, the father, gazes down on this with just impartial eyes. In other words, it's clear that the gods are against me. There's no faith left on earth. Sounding very much, of course, like the very lines that we heard from Agamemnon when he was talking about Clytemnestra to Odysseus, of course, in Book 11 of the Odyssey, saying that time to trust women, it's over. There's no faith left on earth. By the way, this notion of no faith left on earth, well, I mean, you know, when we get to uh, Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach, we're going to hear this same thing. Um, there's no faith left in the world. The only thing we have is love, and she's going to make the argument, whoa. Then she continues with this, talking about Aeneas as if he's not there. Talking to the gods, almost, with Aeneas standing there. Back to it. He, we're told, was washed up on my shores, helpless, and I, I took him in like a maniac. Let him share my kingdom. In other words, Aeneas was a Trojan horse. Salvaged his lost fleet. Plucked his crews from death. Oh, I am swept by the furies. We keep coming back 
to Aeschylus' uh, Oresteia trilogy and especially the third play of the Furies, right? Gales of fire. Now it's Apollo's, the prophet. Apollo's Lycian oracles. There is masters now, and now to top it off, the messenger of the gods, dispatched by Jove himself, comes rushing down the winds with his grim set commands. Really? What work for the gods who live on high? What a concern to ruffle their repose. I won't hold you. Now she's back to Aeneas. I won't even refute you. Go! Strike out for Italy on the winds. You're a realm across the sea. I hope, I pray, if the just gods still have any power, wrecked on the rocks, mid-sea, you'll drink your bowl of pain to the dregs, crying out the name of Dido over and over and whirls away. I'll hound you then with pitch black flames. And when I see death has severed my body from its breath, then my ghost will stalk you. We'll jump ahead to book six, line 521. And of course, he will see her in his journey into the underworld. My ghost will stalk you through the world. You'll pay, you shameless, ruthless. She can't finish a line. And I will hear of it, yes. The report will reach me even among the deepest shades of death. We're told she breaks off, flinging herself from the light of day. He has much at line 490 that he wants to say. She faints, right? We think, of course, of the fainting that will happen in other stories. Andromache fainting, of course, right? Catching her as she faints away, her women bear her back. But Aeneas, we're told, at line 493, 494, is driven by duty now. Now this will set up this debate, so let's put it in our notes. Is Aeneas heroic or is he a villain? And the Roman people will see Aeneas as not a villain, right? For all the reasons he's given, he has to obey the gods. Again, I told you, this is a religious text, first and foremost, right? You've got to obey the gods, and therefore, a sense of duty. That pietas, as we've already said it, that piety, right? Aeneas is driven by duty now. Strongly as he longs to ease and allay his, her, her sorrow, speak to her, turn away her anguish with reassurance, still 